Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is June 26, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 13. Just a few days from now, on July 4, 1976, the United States of America will observe its 200th birthday, our Bicentennial. This is a special milestone in our history which will be here only once and then gone, never to return again. What it should be is a time of thankful reflection on our past, of joyous appreciation of our present, and of eager anticipation of our future. That is what it should be. But it is being ruined deliberately for us by a handful of very powerful people who want to take it all away from you and me. Instead of peacefully celebrating the freedom won for us in the American Revolution two centuries ago, we are being plunged into a so-called Second American Revolution to end that freedom. As Patrick Henry declared in his Liberty or Death speech of March 1775, gentlemen say, Peace, peace! But there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms." Unquote. Economically, politically, and militarily, the war to undo our independence and destroy our way of life is raging all around us today. It is therefore up to us the American people to reaffirm our treasured Declaration of Independence, whose signing we celebrate on July 4, and to enforce it against those who seek to enslave us, the four Rockefeller brothers, along with their client followers. At the conclusion of monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 last month, I challenged those who wield great power on behalf of the four Rockefeller brothers to declare their own independence and begin immediately to work for good instead of evil. The top layer in the vast pyramid of power under Rockefeller control are the innermost circle of Foundation trustees. My associates and I know who they are. There are about a hundred of them, the trustees of a mere dozen foundations controlling the financial and industrial base of America, not only through the foundations themselves, but through their interlocking directorates of banks, multinational corporations, insurance companies, educational institutions, and legal firms, all for the benefit of their Rockefeller bosses, not for yours. These Inner Circle trustees, and they know who they are, have breached a fiduciary trusteeship because the foundations are public supported, being almost totally exempt from United States taxation. I charge these trustees with subversion of schools, churches, government, and the very liberty intended by our Founding Fathers. Their day is coming. They will be unmasked and they will do well to be found hard at work to undo the evil they have set in motion. Otherwise, their power, like that of their masters, the four Rockefeller brothers, can and I believe will be taken away and given to more faithful custodians by an increasingly informed, aroused America. Last month I explained the most important key to the maintenance and expansion of power, deliberate destruction. Today I want to point out how conspiracy they call it commitment is always involved in such deliberate destruction in order to expand their power. My three topics today are Topic No. 1, Conspiracy for Economic Destruction. Topic No. 2, Conspiracy for Political Destruction, and Topic No. 3, 
conspiracy to achieve destruction of human lives. Topic No. 1 Suppose a pair of thugs were to confront you in a parking lot, steal your brand new $5,000 car, sell the unidentifiable parts at a junkyard for $50, and push the rest over a cliff. The thugs will be $50 richer at the expense of your losing a hundred times that much, and the value built into the destroyed car will be permanently lost and irretrievable. If this happened to you, you would be the victim of economic destruction which benefits only the destroyers to the detriment of everyone else. Most thieves, of course, would know better than to just walk up and confront you this way face to face. Instead, they would work out a plan together whereby they could make off with your car without your knowing who did it coordinating their actions so that they would not be caught. The legal term for such planning of an illegal act by two or more individuals is called conspiracy, and in this case it would be a conspiracy for the purpose of economic destruction. If a ring of thieves were to make a continuing business of stealing cars, selling their parts and junking the remains, they would no doubt make sure that they maintained a convincing image as legitimate businessmen so that no one would suspect anything. If they didn't get caught, the members of the auto theft ring might get wealthier and wealthier, appearing to be pillars of the community in the process. But meanwhile their predatory activities behind the scenes would be a serious drain on the community's economy perhaps heightened by the inability after a certain point for residents to buy auto theft insurance. Eventually the unsuspecting townspeople might turn to the little group of citizens who appeared to be wisest because they had become the wealthiest, the well-disguised thieves themselves, to tell them how to solve the community's deepening problems. And the thieves, if they foresaw this opportunity, to steal everything at once might well have a new town charter ready to propose that will put them in charge of everything. This basically is what the four Rockefeller brothers and their close associates are up to economically, economic destruction for their own benefit but on a vast complex scale. I described the economic aspects of, of this three years ago in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. But instead of a new town charter, the Rockefellers have their secret New States of America Constitution ready to enslave us all. The Rockefeller conspiracy for economic destruction is all around us and far advanced. Consider for example the gold situation. I have stated before and repeat again now that David Rockefeller plans for gold to go past $2,000 an ounce and the economic chaos that is being brought on by David and his brothers. And yet, since about the time of the first gold auction by the United States Treasury on January 6, 1975, gold has been defying all natural market influences and slowly dropped in price without regard to anything else that is going on. The situation has gotten so worrisome that at least one newsletter specializing in this area has suspended publication, and other analysts express bewilderment also. The question is, what's wrong with gold prices? The answer has two parts, Fort Knox and South Africa. A year ago the cover-up of the Fort Knox gold scandal was a prime influence in artificially holding down gold prices, as I have explained in earlier tapes. But now the main factor in the gold price is economic warfare against South Africa. The Rockefeller Brothers and their allies, the Rothschilds or Rothschilds as it is often pronounced, have formed a conspiracy to double-cross their associates in South Africa such as the Guggenheims and others. Through joint action on the London gold market, the Rockefeller-Rothschild team 
are manipulating gold prices downward to reduce South Africa's income from gold sales, income that is needed in order to resist the Rockefeller Soviet takeover of Southern Africa that is now far advanced. This tactic against South Africa and all of Southern Africa is having side effects elsewhere as well, such as the suspension of some gold mining operations here and abroad due to the inability of current low gold prices to pay for extraction costs. Early this month on June 2, 1976, the International Monetary Fund held its first gold auction in what will allegedly be a four-year series of gold sales. When the IMF announced the beginning of its gold auction series, the United States Treasury announced that there will be no competing sales of United States gold during that four-year period. A clever move, since there is no United States gold left to sell except for a small amount left over from the two Treasury auctions of 1975, which utilized the illegally obtained gold from the Exchange Stabilization Fund. This tiny leftover amount of United States gold was about 780,000 ounces, and by odd coincidence this was the exact amount sold under the IMF banner in Washington, D.C. on June 2. Was that really IMF gold? Or was it actually the very last of America's gold disposed of in yet another illegal maneuver? Many questions have been asked about the reason for the International Economic Conference being held in Puerto Rico this weekend, which was caused by the United States. But I can reveal to you that one of the main secret topics to be discussed at this conference is whether to continue with further gold auctions by the IMF, even though the IMF has announced a general time schedule for future gold auctions. Should the IMF gold supply be shut off, and once the current turmoil in Southern Africa succeeds in shutting down the gold mines there, the stage will be set at last for gold prices to take off. It will then be just a matter of selecting the proper moment politically. Then the Rockefeller Raw Shield team will take the lid off the gold pressure cooker. Gold will climb ever higher. Paper currencies like the United States dollar, the pound sterling, and others will be thrown into the fires of inflation. The stock market will collapse and the generalized economic destruction sought by the Rockefeller Brothers for their own benefit will begin its final catastrophic phase. The United States economy has been bled dry of its normal resilience and stands on the edge of instability. Banks continue to fail here and there, and just a few days ago more than one-third of Mississippi's savings and loan associations were put under a ban on withdrawals to stop a spreading run on deposits that was bordering on panic. More than 120,000 accounts and nearly half a billion dollars in depositors' money are now tied up, out of reach. Much has happened nationwide in the bank holiday declared by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933. The specific trigger of this situation in Mississippi was localized, but the underlying conditions that allowed it to spread now exist throughout the United States, brought about by faulty, poor banking practices fostered by David Rockefeller, who still thinks of himself as an OSS spy. Those who depend on our Social Security system are also being swindled without mercy. It has now been revealed that the currently foreseeable obligations for Social Security are at least $4,000 billion more than the total projected income into the fund to cover them, half again as large as the estimate just one year ago. The true situation is even worse and accelerating inflation feeding on itself now will either destroy the system or create an unbearable burden 
for current workers. And as I spelled out in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 9, February 1976, the conspiracy to destroy our Postal Service with all the destructive effects that will have, economically and otherwise, is continuing. The recent trial balloons about terminating Saturday mail service are just a pale shadow of things to come. I strongly urge everyone who can do so to get a post office box now while you can. The day is coming when this may well be the only mail service left to us under the destructive control of the Rockefeller Brothers and their corporate Socialist Associates. Topic No. 2. Conspiracy for Political Destruction is an ever-present aspect of the Rockefeller program to bring about the revolutionary changes they desire. In this area of maximum intrigue and deception, the unexpected can happen. The Capitol Hill sex scandals, which broke several weeks ago starting with Congressman Wayne Hayes, are a part of the conspiracy for political destruction in the United States. It was Hayes, acting on behalf of the Rockefeller Brothers, who stopped the Reese Committee investigations into tax-free foundations in 1954, an honest investigation which, had it been allowed to run its course, might well have prevented the national disaster that threatens us today. It was also Hayes, ironically, who nine years ago fought the establishment of the House Ethics Committee, which is now investigating him even though he triggered the downfall of Congressman Adam Clayton Powell on ethical grounds. Now Hayes' own turn has come, and his political destruction is being turned toward the advancement of the Rockefeller political program. After the Hayes scandal broke, it was quickly joined by similar allegations about other members of Congress, and the whole thing is turning into an American rerun of the Profumo Affair that shook up the British Parliament several years ago. This destruction of some political careers breaking at this particular time has two purposes. The first purpose is aimed at the Presidential campaign, while the second, longer-range purpose has to do with the ultimate fate of Congress itself. The first major impact is supposed to come at the Democratic National Convention. The sex scandal so far seem to afflict primarily Democrats, and this is no accident. Not because the Republicans in Congress are the least bit more moral than the Democrats, but because this is a political ploy aimed at the Democratic Party. And already the frightened Democrats are scrambling to introduce so-called reforms in Congressional privileges to try to prop up their image. The next step is to be the downgrading of Jimmy Carter, who at this moment is being proclaimed a sure thing for the nomination. This is planned even though Jimmy Carter is a puppet of David Rockefeller and has been for over three years. Carter was initially chosen as a tool to destroy the George Wallace presidential threat, and this, of course, was successful. Then the Rockefeller major media turned Carter into a steamroller to flatten all the other Democratic contenders as well, except for Rockefeller ally Hubert Humphrey, who knows the score and entered no primaries. California Governor Brown who also has Rockefeller backing, and Senator Henry Jackson, whom Nelson Rockefeller himself had to blow out of the water by alleging that Jackson's staff harbored Communist sympathizers such as Rockefeller's own longtime close associate, Dr. Dorothy Fostick. Right now they are still getting their mileage out of Carter by giving him tremendous publicity as he delivers foreign policy speeches written for him by Professor Brzezinski, who is the Director of the powerful Trilateral Commission 
on behalf of David Rockefeller. And especially, Carter is being used to inject an explicit moral leadership theme into the Presidential campaign. But Carter is scheduled to run into trouble. The Rockefeller-controlled major media made him, and they will unmake him. For example, it will be said that he has no true capacity to survive a campaign, that he is a nobody who has come up from nowhere too fast, and that he lacks humor, that he takes himself too seriously, that he is overconfident in the Dewey style that it is difficult for him to make personal contact, that he does not have the ability to compromise, that he arouses widespread misgivings, that he cannot cope with stress situations, and that he leaves himself open for attack on slip-of-the-tongue personal opinions. These are hardly leadership characteristics. He is therefore the captain of a political Titanic minutes before it sinks to the bottom, along with everyone who is clutching his coattails. By the time the Democratic Convention begins next month, the Rockefeller scenario now is for Carter's supposedly unbeatable delegate lineup to be shaky and vulnerable, and for moral leadership to be a nagging concern thanks to the sex scandals. A deadlock on the first ballot will set the stage for an electrifying upset, with moral leadership assuming a key role. The deadlock convention is programmed to turn at last to H.H., not Hubert Humphrey, but former Senator Harold Hughes of Iowa. Hughes received heavy publicity in the Rockefeller-controlled major media several years ago when he quit the Senate reportedly to pursue religious activities. His credibility as a moral leader will be unsurpassed. But 15 months ago, in my AUDIO BOOK TALKING TAPE No. 2 on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal and What It Means to You, I revealed this plan concocted by Nelson Rockefeller for Hughes to be nominated as a dark horse. In that tape I described him and the way he is to be used, but did not name him, hoping that he would wake up and not go along with this plan. But at the present time everything is still lined up for Hughes to be nominated in this way. Last December 1, 1975, Hughes was even installed as Chairman of the Commission on the Operation of the Senate, a one-year operation set up by the Rockefeller Brothers to be a vehicle for Hughes. This Commission, virtually unknown to the public, makes Hughes highly visible on Capitol Hill, yet practically invisible to the rest of the country, that is, until he receives his cue to walk into the spotlight. In revealing this plan, I must remind you that even as long-standing as it is, and even though it is still on course at this moment, it could still change. The Rockefeller Brothers, as I explained several months ago, are continuing to juggle a lot of factors in their do-or-die catch-up plan, and they always have contingency backup plans. The important thing to know is that you should not be deceived if the Hughes plan is carried out, and what looks like a stunning upset takes place. Remember the words of that old political animal, FDR, nothing ever happens in politics by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way." Unquote. The second and longer-range purpose of the Congressional sex scandals is to begin the final downfall of Congress as an institution, paving the way for Nelson Rockefeller as our President and Dictator to abolish it under his new States of America Constitution. Momentum in this direction is supposed to pick up steam soon with a startling echo of the Watergate scandal, the trial of Gulf oil lobbyist Claude C. Wilde, Jr. for illegal campaign contributions. 
At this time two years ago the Watergate scandal had reached the stage of impeachment proceedings for the political destruction of our last elected President, Richard M. Nixon. This served its purpose of placing Nelson Rockefeller in the Vice Presidency by way of his 25th Amendment to the United States Constitution. But now some of the very legislators who basked in the glory of Nixon's destruction are about to be destroyed themselves in the wake of testimony that they too were guilty of illegal fundraising like that for which they condemned Nixon. Erupting between the two National Conventions, the trial of the Gulf lobbyists is calculated to have destructive political effects on both parties and both Houses of Congress. This same trial after the Republican Convention nominates a Ford Rockefeller ticket is also supposed to ensnare President Ford in scandal. This is the option of several that are ready by which Nelson Rockefeller plans to become Acting President on or about September 19, 1976, after Ford is declared unable to discharge his duties as President under Section 4 of Rockefeller's 25th Amendment. Once he is in position as Acting President, Rockefeller plans to move as rapidly as circumstances allow in dismantling what remains of our free Republic. At the cost of destroying everything the rest of us hold dear about our land, Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller hopes ultimately to realize his own lifelong dream when under his secret new Constitution he begins a nine-year term as our Dictator President. And my friend, only you and I can stop it. Topic No. 3 The idea that any group of people could be both powerful enough and ruthless enough to deliberately conspire to destroy human life by means of war to suit their own purposes is a very hard thing to accept. To most of us human life is a sacred and precious thing, not only our own lives but those of others as well. But to those who are consumed by an insatiable lust for power the most important thing is control control of people and of their lives. If this means that some people have to be destroyed in order to make those who remain more controllable, that is regarded as an acceptable cost by these power-hungry people. For example, the Communist regime that rules mainland China today was brought into power at an estimated cost of 64 million lives. But three years ago, while Rockefeller agent Cho En Lai was still alive, David Rockefeller said, quote, Whatever the price of the Chinese Revolution, it has obviously succeeded in producing a more efficient and dedicated administration. Unquote. And he went on to add, quote, The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in human history." Unquote. Since David wrote those words, however, Zhou Enlai has passed from the scene and China for all intents and purposes has slipped free of Rockefeller control. This removes China from the success category by Rockefeller definition, and China therefore now has to be whipped back into line by means of war. Japan, too, is straining at the bonds of Rockefeller control and is therefore being forced by the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance into the red Chinese orbit so that both nations can be crushed into submission together with one shot. As I explained in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 of November 1975, the war now building in the Middle East is engineered to set the stage for the far larger war in Asia, which in turn is to be the prelude to Nuclear War I 
waged primarily on American soil. To see that control matters more to the Rockefeller Brothers than does human life, one need only to compare our foreign policies toward Canada and the Soviet Union. Canada, our friendly neighbor who in no way threatens our lives, is guilty of wanting to be independent of Rockefeller control, an unpardonable sin in the eyes of the Rockefeller Brothers. So the Rockefellers have declared economic and political war on Canada with explanations such as that given earlier this month in an interview by the United States Ambassador to Canada. He said, quote, Canada can't simply unilaterally cut back on its relations with the United States and expect there won't be a reaction from us." Unquote. So now Canada has on its hands the hot issue of the air traffic controllers dispute. If the Canadian Government would investigate the real reason why the Premier of Quebec, Mr. Barassa, pushed through the Quebec Legislature his Extreme Bill No. 22 about 19 months ago, making the French language the official working language within the Quebec Province, the investigators may well find that the bottom line in this bilingual issue is to restore Rockefeller control over all Canadian affairs by engineering their own John Turner, former Finance Minister of Canada, into the office of Premiership. By contrast, the Soviet Union does now pose a grave threat to millions of American lives, but the Rockefeller Brothers still think they do control their Soviet allies, so they keep right on aiding Russia financially, technically, and militarily. For just one recent extremely serious example of how Russia is thus being equipped by the Rockefeller Brothers to be our mass executioner, I refer you to their lead article in the June 7, 1976 issue of the Daily News Digest, Box 27496, Phoenix, Arizona, 85061. This article, suppressed by the Rockefeller major media in the United States, details the way in which an 8 to 10 year jump in Soviet missile technology has been handed to them on a platter within the past year with disastrous implications for us. But developments like these are simply climaxing a process that has been going on out of public eye for a very long time. For example, when I was in private law practice in Washington during the 50s, I once had a case involving an oceanographic physicist who was being railroaded out of his naval job by some admirals on the false ground that he had associated with Communists in 1933 while working his way through college. The truth behind these charges turned out to be that the admirals simply wanted to get rid of him because they wanted to spend their appropriations on ships of all kinds while my client was pressing hard for high priority to be given also to research on obtaining hydrogen energy from the seas, a field in which the Soviet Union was 15 years ahead of us. Because of legal work I had done in connection with the Federal prison system, it happened that I knew Senator William Langer, who was Chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee. I told him about the predicament of my client, the Navy physicist whereupon he suggested that I send my client to see Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. He said it was really Dulles, not President Eisenhower, who was running the government, and that if I wanted to get my client reinstated in his Navy job, Dulles was the man to see. I said, OK, and Senator Langer got an appointment for my client to see Dulles. Neither my client nor I was prepared for what happened next. John Foster Dulles was a former head of the Rockefeller Foundation, but I had yet to learn the true significance of that, nor did I know at that time that President Eisenhower was merely a figurehead, just one more in a succession of Rockefeller puppet presidents. Eisenhower's nomination in 1952 had been engineered by Winthrop Aldrich, the uncle of Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers 
by handing out literally baskets of cash to Republican Convention delegates at his suite in the Blackstone Hotel. Nor for that matter did I at that time have the slightest inkling about what the Rockefeller Brothers were really up to. Senator Langer advised me not to accompany my client to his appointment with Dulles, explaining that for some reason Dulles was very wary of any lawyer-client presence in private conversations. So off my client went to see Dulles alone. A short while later he reappeared at my office, white as a sheet, looking as if he had seen a ghost. When I asked him what had happened, he said he had gone and told his story to the Secretary of State Dulles, whereupon Dulles answered, and I quote, Since they say you have associated with Communists, whether true or not, why don't you go to Russia? They need people like you." Unquote. My client could hardly believe his ears. Here was our own Secretary of State, proclaimed by the media to be staunchly anti-Soviet, anti-Communist, telling my client to go to a Communist country and help them. He recovered from his shock to hear the following advice from Dulles, and I quote, Go to the Soviet Embassy on 16th Street here in Washington, and they will receive you." Unquote. My client thanked him for his time and left to report to me immediately. I was appalled, too, by what had transpired with Dulles. After some further discussion, my client said he would have to talk things over with his wife and would be back in touch. Two days later he decided to visit the Soviet Embassy, and sure enough they had been expecting him. They told him he would be well taken care of in the Soviet Union. He would be given an automobile, a fine apartment, and other special privileges, and would be flown to Moscow with his wife and small children in first-class accommodations. My client told me it was an offer he could hardly afford to refuse, since he was now cut off from money and jobs here in the United States by the big lie about his having consorted with Communists in his college days. And so two weeks after his astonishing private talk with Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, he and his family flew off to the Soviet Union, where he is now doing research on hydrogen energy in the oceanographic laboratories of the Soviet Government. It's no wonder that our present Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who is the John Foster Dulles of today, privately says that America's time has passed and the future belongs to the Soviets. Like his predecessors and his masters, the Rockefeller Brothers, Kissinger is doing everything in his power to make this bleak forecast come true. The story of ever-expanding joint Rockefeller-Soviet domination of nation after nation is a story of destruction, destruction of economies, destruction of political institutions destruction of freedom and individual choice, and in every case destruction of human life, all done in secrecy so that you won't know about it. Right now the Rockefellers and their Soviet partners are in the process of destroying Southern Africa just as they have destroyed other parts of Africa in order to obtain control over it and its immense richness in natural resources. According to the Rockefeller CIA timetable, I first revealed in February 1974 the Union of South Africa now has less than a year to go before it is utterly destroyed. Africa's troubles really began when John D. Rockefeller III took a two-month trip there in 1948 as a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation ostensibly out of concern over the health and welfare of the natives, but actually to survey the commercial and industrial potentialities just as they had once done in Japan years before. When he came back from Africa he was so excited over the vast natural resources there that he could hardly keep himself on the subject of his professed interest, the natives, in an interview with the New York Times. And within a few years a crescendo of black upheaval, death, and destruction began in Africa 
that still has not ended. This has been brought about by the combined efforts of the Rockefeller-controlled foundations, the International Labor Organization of the AFL-CIO, the CIA, and the Soviet KGB working together abroad. It is a fact of life that the blacks in Africa are not yet capable of carrying on business, commerce, and industry all by themselves, and they know it, as I know from my own personal experience of five years in Africa. So although the basic industries are always nationalized by the new black governments as they take over as a face-saving gesture, they then have to turn right around and give the management contracts to the white corporate socialists, who thereby earn income in the form of fees larger than if they owned the assets outright themselves. On top of that, double sets of books are then kept by the corporate socialist managers so as to pay low taxes and royalties while actually exploiting cheap local labor to produce huge amounts of low-cost raw materials for use by Rockefeller multinational corporations in the industrialized countries. The whole thing is immensely profitable to the corporate socialists, and that is why destructive revolutions and massacres are stirred up in order to bring about this kind of arrangement. This is what Rockefeller agent Henry Kissinger is actually working for in Southern Africa today, handing out millions of American tax dollars to revolutionary blacks while he publicly expresses pious satisfaction over the progress being made there toward majority rule. In the same vein, Joseph Stalin used to say that everything in the Soviet Union belonged to the people, but then he would add, quote, We are only managing it for you, unquote. The trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace were right about one thing they decided in 1908 and 1909. War does completely transform the life of a nation. Close your eyes and try for a moment to see beautiful, quiet villages nestled on the sides of hills and mountains with the smell of cedars in the air and snow caps on the mountain tops most of the year. Visualize gentle, kind, happy working people, prosperous and contented in their peaceful country people with a song in their hearts and love for their neighbors, people who pray, each according to his own faith, people who are tolerant, who practice the golden rule, and who say to each his own, a country with a strong banking, business, and industrial base, a country uninterested in conflict and intrigue, a little more than a militia as its military establishment. Would I be speaking of Switzerland? No. I would be describing Lebanon, the Switzerland of the Middle East, the Lebanon that I knew and loved, and the Lebanon that has now been destroyed in a nightmare of senseless terror, destruction, and mayhem. What has happened would never have happened spontaneously. The people simply are not like that, but little Lebanon just by being there has been caught up in a bigger picture, the deliberate triggering of general war in the Middle East, which is to culminate in Nuclear War I in the United States. Just as Jamaica is now being destabilized by the CIA, causing death, destruction, and a state of emergency, the agony of Lebanon has been brought about deliberately by the Rockefeller-controlled CIA under direction of the CIA station in Athens, Greece, using agents infiltrated into Lebanon from Libya, which is totally controlled by the CIA. Nearly one out of every hundred persons in Lebanon has now died in the violence there, and no one in that country now remains untouched by the horrible tragedy there. Yet as terrible as they are, the death throes of Lebanon are intended by the Rockefeller Brothers to be nothing more than the match that ignites the forest fire of Nuclear War I. Lebanon is only a convenience for them. 
it is you and I who are the ultimate targets. If the crescendo of war that has been planned by the Rockefeller Soviet conspiracy is allowed to run its course, the final phase will be the nuclear destruction of the southern half of the United States in Nuclear War I. As I first revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 last month, a super-secret nuclear safe zone has been set up by secret agreement between the four Rockefeller brothers and their Soviet allies, consisting of a swath across the northern United States and southern Canada between the 40th and 50th parallels of latitude. All the states to the south of this zone, plus Alaska and Hawaii, have been condemned by the Rockefeller brothers to have the ultimate in human destruction rain down on their heads, thermonuclear war. To the Rockefeller brothers there is such a thing as excess population and excess people whose unwanted numbers make it difficult to maintain the rigid control over people that they desire. So the war they have planned for America will to them amount to nothing more than a very fast, efficient form of population control which all four of them, John, Nelson, David, and Lawrence, publicly promote in every possible way. The industrial heartland and much of the breadbasket of America are to be preserved within the nuclear safe zone because these will be needed after the war both to keep supporting the Soviet Union, an artificial state which cannot support itself, and as the base for reorganized industry in the planned new states of America under complete totalitarian corporate socialism. These resources they want to protect. It is only excess human lives that they mainly want to get rid of in order to strengthen their control over those who are left. In this nuclear attack, according to intelligence sources, the Soviet Union now has the option of using what are called clean hydrogen warheads. Most hydrogen bombs are triggered by atomic bombs, and this atom bomb trigger is where most of the radioactive fallout comes from. But the Soviets, with huge amounts of aid, have now perfected the technology to set up a hydrogen warhead in another way, and by setting off such a warhead above a city instead of right on the ground, it is possible to destroy all life in the attack zone and yet produce very little radioactive fallout to drift downward. Such warfare can therefore be used to cut the population of the United States in half, yet leave the vast natural resources of America largely intact, ready for further exploitation. The lives of many of those living in the southern half of the United States are scheduled to be sacrificed on the altar of Rockefeller control if these hideous, inhuman plans are allowed to be carried out. Tens of millions of our lives are considered by them to be expendable. There are no civil defense preparations for us like those in the Soviet Union, but where our rulers' own lives are concerned, that is another matter. A network of 96 underground cities known as the Federal Relocation Arc has been built to house thousands of key Federal officials when war arrives keeping them safe and comfortable, immune to the nuclear holocaust taking place all around them. And as I revealed last month, the four Rockefeller brothers and their intimate client followers have quietly prepared their own hideaways inside the nuclear safe zone in order to ride out the coming war unharmed. The middle of the nuclear safe zone is the 45th parallel, and almost at that exact latitude the Rockefeller Brothers have their fortified hideaways already on Mount Desert Island and Bartlett Island off the coast of Maine. What the Rockefeller Brothers do not realize is that they have already been marked for a selective double-cross by their Soviet allies in the coming Nuclear War I. The Rockefeller Brothers have an instinct for conspiracy and especially for the double-cross but they are not the only ones who can play the game, and according to intelligence sources, the arrangements that have been made for their double-cross 
involve a kind of poetic justice, gruesome though it is. There exists today a large and growing black market in plutonium, which is the raw material for atomic bombs, as well as for the incredibly dangerous next generation of nuclear power plants now on the drawing boards. The Rockefeller Brothers themselves, convinced that a plutonium energy economy is the wave of the future, are the leaders in this growing plutonium black market just as they are in the rest of the nuclear field. It is therefore ironic that they themselves are now in a position to be destroyed by means of plutonium. At least one powerful atomic bomb made with plutonium now has been planted at the small cove known as Seal Harbor, Maine, strategically located to blast the summer homes of both Nelson and David Rockefeller, which are located on opposite sides of Seal Harbor. I have not been informed as yet of any similar arrangements at David's new fortifications on nearby Bartlett Island, but time may change that because the Soviets intend to leave nothing to chance in their double-cross of the Rockefeller Brothers. For example, the Brothers may think they can escape anyway by fleeing to the remote mountaintop fortress in Venezuela, which is accessible only by air. Rockefeller private aircraft are kept on 24-hour call for just such an escape, but there too they are in for a surprise. So happens that the Marxist Prime Minister of neighboring Guyana, Forbes Burnham, who was put into power a decade ago by David Rockefeller's CIA, is already double-crossing David. The gold produced by Guyana, which is what attracted David's interest in the first place, is for the most part being stashed away in caves, unreported to David. For once the Rockefellers are on the receiving end of a swindle through double bookkeeping process, and the nuclear missiles which ring the huge Tamara airfield in Guyana now include one target not planned by the Rockefeller Brothers. Not only are they targeted on the Panama Canal, which is our new Pearl Harbor, and not only are they aimed at cities in the southern half of the United States in readiness for the planned war to come, but the Venezuelan retreat of the Rockefellers is also targeted. The Soviets, who have yet to live up to any agreement they have ever made, intend to break free of the Rockefeller grip on them when the time is ripe. After eliminating the Rockefeller Brothers from the scene, the Soviets expect to step into full control themselves, use the corporate socialist managers who now work with the Rockefellers to do their own bidding, just as they found managers in Eastern Europe to do their bidding after it was conquered. This, my friend, is where the Rockefeller conspiracy to destroy economies societies and human lives is leading to the destruction of the Rockefeller Brothers themselves and the destruction of our nation and our way of life in the process. That is, my friend, if we sit idly by and allow it to happen. Listen again to the things I urged you to do at the end of monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 12 last month. It is essential that as many Americans as possible be informed of the disaster now threatening us and get behind the drive to stop it. But it will take the actions of individuals like you acting on your own initiative to make it happen. Our situation today is once again expressed by the words of Thomas Paine, who in December 1776 wrote in the crisis these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country, but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.